You're listening to Sound, Sound. Insightful. Insightful. Insightful Bible Teaching For a Meaningful, meaningful. For a Meaningful Christian Walk we're, we're on a kind of a trend, we have a lot of verses This week, unlike other weeks, we're actually going to cover most of them Ooh. So hang on, my goal is still to get done by quarter after You can pray for me so tonight is the third message in our series on salvation. And it's like, a, I don't know if it's like a trilogy or something like this. Each part is important. If you just have the first two parts, first one was our assurance and security of salvation. Last week we saw judicial redemption and organic salvation, the process that we enter into. Today is the outcome. If we don't have this, the previous two messages won't make that much sense. Because the question you can ask, and we asked this last week for you to think about, one day we believe, we receive the Lord, we're justified, we begin to enjoy the Lord, and then we quit. For whatever reason. It happens, right? And the question is, what happens to us? We, we know our salvation is secure. It'd be like, you know, this can't happen humanly, but just imagine. A baby's born, begins to eat, when he's about two years old, stops eating, stops growing. Of course, we know they would die. But just imagine they wouldn't. Where are they? They're not full grown, uh, not that useful. They haven't reached their potential. Is this what God wants? No, it's not what he wants. He wants us to enter into this process to become a full-grown man. This song we just sang, excellent, right? Until we all arrive at a full-grown man. This is the goal of God's complete salvation. But what happened if Aaron, when he was five years old, stopped eating? He'd be three feet tall. <laughs> We, we wouldn't enjoy the full Aaron, right? The full Aaron experience. So, then we've got verses in the Bible, a lot of verses, that seem like, are we saved by grace or are we saved by works? We had a verse last week, work out your own salvation. Um, there's other verses we'll get into tonight. So people have puzzled over this. And we've talked about before, there's kind of two main schools. Um, Calvinism, which is, you know, you're selected by God. Uh, they do very much hold to salvation being eternal, secure. Uh, counter to that is Arminianism, named after this guy named Arminius. And he also saw verses, it's like, no, you got to lose your salvation. You've got to be able to lose your salvation. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Calvinists would say, well, we make it make sense this way. You know, you're selected by God. You're saved. And the proof of your salvation is you will persevere until the end. If you don't persevere until the end, that's a proof you were not saved in the first place. Which to me is really a bad deal. Because... I'm not going to get into predestination versus free will, but they're both in the Bible. And, you know, just imagine yourself, Mitchell, you know, one day you're a raw heathen, atheist, something happens, you turn your heart to the Lord, and you do exactly what the Bible says, right? You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you get baptized, and you begin reading the Bible, going to Bible studies, loving to fellowship with others, and then something happens, turns you off to God. And so you, you, you stop in the process. Then one day you will appear before the judgment seat, and we're going to get into that tonight. And God would just say, well, that just shows you weren't saved in the first place. It's like, yeah, but, you know, if you ever go have a test, um, you got the book, 
And the professor says, no, that you answered that question wrong. And you say, yeah, but right here in the book, it says exactly what I answered. So you can go to the Bible, which is God's word. You can say, I believed. I confessed with my mouth. According to Romans 10, I'm saved. Now you're saying I wasn't saved to begin with? What kind of joke is that? Of course, you have to be careful having that kind of conversation with God. But you get my point. But then the other side is you can lose your salvation. But we know that's not true because we went through at length just to see so many supporting uh, verses, concepts, you know, facts. We don't lose our salvation. So then it's like, does our life matter? It does. So if we don't have the final exam, if we don't have graduating with honors versus going back for summer school, our life doesn't matter. How, our, how we live does not matter. If we're only presented with the really oversimplified gospel of, I believe in Jesus, I'm going to go to heaven. If I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to go to hell. If those are your only two options, then you have to come up with something that's been come up with before. But what has been come up with is really not fully according to the Bible. Now, I, I, I got to... You know, I'm, I'm careful when I say these things because I don't want to speak anything heretical. And I also can say, this is not something I came up with. And it's not something Zach and I got together and came up with. This is, you know, you go back to the first centuries. This is what people believed. But through the ages, there was a lot of superstition, a lot of ignorance, a lot of illiteracy. Bible is not available until about 500 years ago then we had a real recovery of the truths in the Bible. So what I'm speaking, others have been speaking for a long, long time. But it may not be what kind of people's concepts are. So I, I would just encourage you, everything that we share, when I say we, that's me. Um, but it's we. If you've got a question about it, go to the Bible. And just examine, see if these are, things are so. If you've got a question about it, you're not clear, come and, come and talk to us. Um, and if you go around telling people, I was at this higher ground meeting, and they said some things I've never heard before. And someone might say, oh, man, that's heretical. Those guys, wow, look out for them. No, they, they can say that. But we need to be fully assured in the, all the matters of the truth. And Mitchell, if you ever talk to some guy and he says, no, no, that's not the case. Um, better stay away from those guys. They're teaching strange things. I would really appreciate it if you'd come and tell us that. Not to challenge anybody. But sometimes it's like, you know, you hear something troubling, troublesome. You might even hear it from me. Don't be afraid to bring that up. It's like I heard something. and I told someone what was shared, and they said, no, that's not right. Uh, it's not offensive. I mean, we've been into this stuff a lot. So I know what people will teach and know what they'll say. So I'm just saying this kind of at the outset. Hopefully tonight you're not going to be troubled. But um, you might be a little challenged. And I think... You might hear something that maybe you haven't quite heard before, but it's really important because this is God's plan, this is the Bible, this is the Word of God. So we need to understand these things. Where are we? we got 25 minutes. You think we can use, get done? Okay, I'm going to go through some things fairly quickly, but hopefully very clearly. Now, you know, when, when I like would be teaching something, we always encourage questions. And unfortunately, tonight it's like so compressed. But actually, I'd like to, if someone said, wait, 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 hang on. We can't do it. But I can see it in your eyes. So it's like, are you confused? Okay, 
then, then we might go back over. So I, I, I just have a question. You know, what, when, I, when I said earlier, you know, go to heaven versus go to hell. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But it's not really that accurate. It's interesting. Um, I don't know what kind of theology like an eight-year-old has. But when I was eight years old, my concept, everyone's concept that I knew, you die, you go to heaven, you become an angel. Um, I have no idea where that comes from. Maybe it was in a book somewhere or something, a movie. There's nothing in the Bible that says you become an angel when you die. And now you don't hear that. Maybe it's in some children's storybooks or something. But I don't think people have that concept. And even more interesting to me, um, I've been to a number of funerals. I'm older. So people I know are older and they die. Hopefully you haven't been to that many funerals. But it used to be when you go to a funeral, uh, the comforting words are, you know, he's in heaven now. She's in heaven now. I went to my aunt's funeral. 40 years ago, and the pastor gave a really nice kind of sermon, or I'm not sure you call it a sermon for a funeral, whatever it was, and he talked about, you know, now she's in this place with golden streets and pearl gates, you know, this is the description of heaven. If you get in the Bible, that is not the description of heaven. That's the description of the holy city, the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, which comes down out of heaven to the earth. It's not a description of heaven. Actually, it's a sign. Someday we'll get into that, those sort of things too. I don't want to get so much into what's going to happen in the future. It's really interesting. But when they talk about heaven, that's not what they talk about. I've gone to a, the last probably three or four funerals I've gone to, some of you have not gone to three or four funerals in your life, thankfully. They have not mentioned going to heaven. They say this person is now with the Lord, which is a very accurate way of speaking. Because there's a certain degree of, we don't aren't quite sure where they are. I know they're with the Lord. Now, I'm going to ask a question. Um... When Jesus was crucified, was he crucified by himself? No. no. Uh, were there other people crucified with him? How many? Two. Uh, they were criminals. They were thieves, murderers. In the account in the book of Luke, there's some interaction between, actually between all three of them, but mainly one one of the thieves is saying to Jesus, save yourself and us if you're the son of God. The other one says, hey, buddy, we deserve this. He doesn't. But then he turns to Jesus. He says, you know, when you come into your kingdom, I think is what he said, remember me. Does anybody know what Jesus said to him right then? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So that means that that day Jesus went to heaven and took him with him, right? Now, okay, now I'm going to go to a little bit of theology, church history. Oh, Lord, i got to get through this. This stuff's really important. Um, they have church councils way back when, in the first centuries, to determine, like, it's like a statement of faith. And they call these things the creeds. So there's some famous creeds. I think many of you might have memorized them in confirmation classes or whatever. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. There's a number of them. Um, I still remember. I memorized it. In the creeds, it's very clear. It says Jesus was you know, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead and buried, it does not say he ascended into heaven. It says he descended into hell. Jesus told, what did he tell the thief? He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Where did Jesus go that day? Yeah, just down into hell? 
I mean, in the, in the English translation, we use hell. The Greek word is Hades. Old Testament Hebrew word is Sheol. This is where the dead people are. This, and anyway, this is important. This shows if we really read the Bible accurately, we can kind of defuse this idea of I'm immediately going to heaven. Now, I'm not saying, you know, if you overcome or you're with the Lord, you will be raptured to the throne in heaven. I'm not saying, no, we're never going to go to heaven, we're never going to set foot there. That's not true. But when we die, we go to, we go to hell. Now, what is hell like, Aaron? Not very fun. Not very fun. Okay. And this is another problem. When we hear hell, we've got the concept the devil's there with the pitchfork, which is also not true. Um, and there's fire and all these kind of bad things. Okay, in the same book in Luke, these verses are on there. If you look at Luke 16, I'll just tell you the story. There's a rich man and there's a beggar. And... The beggar's name is Lazarus. He's not the same Lazarus that got resurrected by the Lord. Must have been a common name. Anyway, Lazarus dies. Rich man dies. Rich man finds himself in a very unpleasant place. In verse 23, if you look there, it says, In Hades, this is using the Greek word, not the English translation. In Hades, he, hears the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torment. This is bad, right? Sees Abraham from afar. Abraham is Abraham, you know, he's a godly man. And um, Lazarus, this beggar's in his bosom. He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in anguish in this flame. So there's the bad part, right? But where Abraham and Lazarus were, it's really nice. So... This is paradise. But this is not paradise as heaven. When people die, you know, they, their inner being goes to somewhere under the earth. This is, this is the whole concept consistent with the whole Bible. And they're there, they're in a bad part or they're in a good part. And they must be able to talk to each other. But Abraham, if you read through the whole story, he says, anyway, um, even if we wanted to go towards you, we can't. There's a chasm between us we can't cross over. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is giving his own experience. And this one, you have to read it correctly. He's talking about, he said, I know a man in Christ. It, it's later on, it's very clear that's him. He says, such a one was caught away to the third heaven. When the Bible, when it says the third heaven, that's our concept of heaven. There's the air above us, there's the outer space, and there's the third heaven, which is where God is. So Paul was actually caught away to the third heaven. That's great, right? Then he continues, and I know of such a man that he was caught away into paradise. So he's talking about two different places. This is just further kind of... Um, proof that our immediate destination after death is not heaven. Now, we'll get into why that's important. I got 15 minutes. Left. This is great. Okay. Now, when you study the Bible, you need to know, be aware that there are different peoples in the Bible. There are the Jews, there are uh, the believers, the New Testament believers, God's people. And then there are also unbelievers. And there are certain portions in the Bible that are written that apply to one group or another. We don't have time to get into all the differences tonight. But just be aware, sometimes when you read something, you might be scared or impressed or something like this without realizing this does not apply to me. This is written for someone else. 
But the parts that do apply to us, we need to be very aware and take those seriously. So, in the Bible, it's clear that uh, there will be a judgment on every living soul that's ever lived. Some of them will be dead already, but they'll be, uh, you know, either enjoying their time in paradise or not enjoying their time. We could call, call the other part hell. It's fine. But anyway, everyone's going to get judged. And the judgments will come at different times. So for the believers, we'll get into that a little bit later. For the unbelievers, when the Lord returns, there will be people alive on the earth. There will be unbelievers alive on the earth. And the Lord, this is the verses in Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31. And these are, this is a very famous porch portion, which I think probably uniformly is misapplied. Because Jesus will have all the unbelievers there with him who are alive at that time. And he'll, some of them will be the sheep, some will be the goats. And the sheep, he, he gives them some praise. And he says, enter into my joy, into the, how does the verse go? Um, this is verse 34. You know, come you are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The ones on his left, those are the goats. Go away from me, you are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This does not apply to the believers. Because he'll say, they say, um, you know, kind of what, what did we do? And he says, well, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. You visited me in prison. You gave me a drink. All these things. And then they, they say, when did we do this? I'd never seen you before. And he says, when you did it to one of my followers, one of these little ones, one of my sheep, you did it to me. They get a reward. Others, he said, you didn't do that. And they say, when didn't we do that to you? It's like when you didn't take care of my people. This will be the, at the end of the Great Tribulation, which is another big subject. So some people will be aiding the people of God, even though they're not believers. And some will be not helping the people of God. Some will get a reward, some will get a punishment. Then, after the Lord returns, there's a period of 1,000 years is very clear in the book of Revelation. Exactly what will go on during that time, it's hard to say. There's not that much detail, but there are some things that will go on. Anyway, at the end of that time, there will be another judgment on the unbelievers. And this is in Revelation 25. It says, the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were completed. So everyone gets resurrected but they get resurrected to be judged. And some will receive a reward, even among the unbelievers. Others, most of them will go to the lake of fire. That will be their eternal destiny. That's when we talk about hell. That's what we're really talking about, is the lake of fire. There's a great white throne, and he'll judge them according to their works. And if anyone's not found written in the book of life, he's cast into the lake of fire. So this is for the unbelievers. Now, for the believers, we need to be very, very, very clear that believers will be judged. I mean, there are, there's a lot of teaching that we've escaped the judgment. And that is just not true. It's not like one obscure verse in the Bible. We need to see. It's like, you know, you take a test... Someone says, there's not going to be any exam. It's like, come on. What, what, what class has there never been an exam for? Well, you don't need to study. I don't know. If there's a class like that, I don't want to take it. You know, it's not worth anything. If you look at 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, um, 
In this verse it says, we don't judge anything until the Lord comes. And at that point, he will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. When the Lord comes, there will be a judgment. 2 Timothy 4 eight, Paul is saying he knew that there's a crown of righteousness laid for, up for him. He says, the, the Lord, the righteous judge, will recompense me in that day. 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, We must all be manifested before the judgment seat of Christ. We can receive the things done through the body according to what he has practiced, whether good or bad. Romans 14.10 says, We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And 12 says, Each one of us will give an account These are all verses written to Christians. These were not written to unbelievers. Paul is saying, we all. That includes him. So, will we stand before the judgment seat of Christ? We need to be clear about this. So then the question is, what are we going to be judged on? If you're taking a class take an entomology class, right? Are you going to study um, medieval literature? I think you'll study entomology, right? It's clear. This is what the test is going to be on. So for a Christian life, it should be the same. We, We should be clear. Now, I want to take a little, it's not a digression, but Rightfully so, we're, we're concerned about sin. You know, I get this question a lot. If I do this, is that a sin? You know, is this a sin? Is that a sin? You know, there is such a thing as sin. And sin is a serious matter. But on the other hand, sin has been taken care of. On the cross, Christ redeemed us. It says, you know, he's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Um... Christ suffered once for sins. So sin, on one hand, is dealt with. But we need to apply that. So our Christian life, now we've we've gone from judicial to organic. And this is really a life of being in fellowship with God, walking with God, enjoying God. But then sometimes Stephen will lose his temper. You know, or... He'll hit Daniel. <laughs> you know. Well, what should he do? Or he'll get his test, he'll get a bad grade, and he'll, he'll curse God. Oh, why did you make this so hard? Why are you doing this to me? Well, that, that's a problem. But that's easily dealt with. If you go to 1 John chapter 1, 7, 8, and 9, we need to walk in the light. But then verse 9 in particular, it says, if we confess our sins. So when Stephen gets mad at God, right then he just needs to say, Lord, uh, forgive me. I just lost my temper. Um, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And the Lord, he already died for you. I mean, that's a small thing. I mean, do you think he's not going to forgive you? He'll say, oh, I'm so happy. You turned to me and asked, you know, said you're sorry, you repented. And so then he's faithful and he's righteous to forgive us our sins. So we can continue walking in fellowship with God. So we do need to take care of sins. But that's not the main thing in our life. Um, Oh, Lord. I've still got five minutes. This is great. We're doing really good. Um, these, These next three verses... Uh, under reward and punishment. There's Luke 14, 14, Philippians 3, 11, and Hebrews 11, 35. Am I going too fast? This is all really clear, right? When you go home, think about it, you realize I didn't really catch all that. We can talk about it more later as we get into this. Remember I said everyone gets resurrected? Believers, unbelievers. You just, you know, When I die, if I die before the Lord returns, my soul will go, I believe, into the very pleasant part of Hades. I'll just rest there. 
then one day the Lord will return to the earth and I'll get resurrected. Maybe you'll be there with me. Maybe you'll be alive at that time. And I'll say, oh, long hell, it's so good to see you. And you'll go, oh, what are you doing here? I thought you were dead. <laughs> you won't say that because you realize, you know the truth in the Bible. It's like, I've been waiting for you. I knew you were going to get resurrected. So then we're going to resurrect. We'll stand next to each other. We're going to go to the judgment seat. But um, Luke 14, 14 says, um, it will be repaid to you in the resurrection of the righteous. So in the resurrection, there's a differentiation. It's not all the same. Paul in Philippians, you know, Paul, he was a top apostle. But he said he wants to attain to the out-resurrection from the dead. Uh, this, is, this is the best translation of that Greek word. Some English translations, they just say, I want to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's like saying, I hope the sun rises tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Everyone get resurrected. It's nothing to attain to. Whether you're good, whether you're bad, you're going to get resurrected. But some will have an outstanding resurrection. It's something you're looking forward to. And then Hebrews 11.35 talks about a better resurrection. You know, you're, you're college students, right? Um, you can break it down into classes. You can talk about graduation. Um, you, you might not look forward to getting your, your exam back. It's like, how bad did I do? But if you've been a diligent student, and you've studied hard, you've learned the material, and I would even say if you enjoyed the material, then it's just like, oh, there's a test today. No problem. Take the test. Two days later, you know, the professor's going to give the test back. You're like, great, I'm going to get an A. You know. Paul, he, he knew. He said, the Lord is going to give me the crown of glory. He knew. He, he had not died yet. There was no suspense. He knew that he'd finished his course, he'd finished the race. So when we get resurrected, I hope most of us don't ever have to go through resurrection. I don't think it's a difficult process. But what I mean is, we'll all be alive, the Lord will come soon. And we can just be there to meet the Lord. That's the best. But if we do, maybe maybe just me and Peter. We'll be, we'll be sitting there, we, we can talk to Abraham, he, he'll be there, and then the bell will ring or whatever, and it's like, oh, resurrection time. Okay, let's head back up to earth. I'm going to get my reward. Versus, I'm going to get a punishment. So, in um, these verses, the next set of verses, Revelation 22, 12, the Lord says, I come quickly. Quickly, my reward is with me to render to each one as his work is. Matthew 16, 27 says, He will repay each man according to his doings. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, this is a very good portion. Um, it says, The work of each one will become manifest. So as we're alive on the earth, we're working, we're building something. And it says, That work will be tested by fire. I don't know literally what that means, but I do know that it's going to go through a testing. If our work is made of burnable materials, it will burn. But if we're building with the divine materials, it will not burn. It will survive the test. So it, it says that um, if anyone's work, which is built upon the foundation, remains, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is consumed, he will suffer loss. But then this is really important. It says, but he himself will be saved. So this is a very strong proof that that suffering loss is not losing your salvation. It is losing the reward. But he'll be saved yet so as through fire. Give me three more minutes. We're doing okay, right? I, have I totally lost everybody? Mitchell's, Mitchell's I don't see the glazed over look in everyone's eyes. So our Christian life consists of 
one day believing in the Lord Jesus. We receive him as life, we are saved judicially, then we grow in life. As we're growing, we need to part, you know, cooperate with the Lord in what he's doing. The Probably the clearest parable is in Matthew 25. I've got a few verses of that here. The Lord had three servants, three slaves. He gave them his possessions. And he said, do business until I return. And after a long time, he comes back. And the first two, well, first, what are the Lord's possessions? Uh, we're all the Lord's possessions. The unbelievers are the Lord's possession. The church is the Lord's possession. The truth is the Lord's possession. The gospel is the Lord's possession. These things have been given to you. How are you going to handle them? Some took them and multiplied them. You know, you can imagine, Mitchell, you get Aaron and Aaron. They're, they're the ones, the sheep you're going to take care of. You do a good job. And then they start taking care of some more people. And then you'll stand before the Lord and it's like, Mitchell, how did you do? I gave you Aaron and Aaron. And it's like, yeah, I got Aaron and Aaron. Now I got Steve and Bill and Joe and Pete and Julie and Susan and their kids. And the Lord says, well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You get a reward. And then Stephen does similar. He's given the truth and the gospel. He becomes a good teacher. And, but then Natasha comes. And the Lord says, hey, Natasha, good to see you. <laughs> and she's like, I've been dreading this day. And, you know, remember what I gave you? And she's like, yeah. Um, you know, I gave you Hannah. And she says, well, she's still here. <laughs> and he, he's, no, 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 that's not the way it works. So, um, you are going to be cast into outer darkness. This is what the Bible says. What is outer darkness? I don't really know. But I do know it's not pleasant. It says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is this eternal? No. But remember earlier we said there's a thousand years between the Lord's first return and then at the end of a thousand years everything gets cleared up. There's the judgment, the great white throne. But then we enter into eternity future. All of God's people will be there with him. You could say that thousand years, I've heard it likened to summer school. I think summer school will be more pleasant than that. But can you imagine, Natasha? You're there, you see, you know, Mitchell's there enjoying, and Stephen's there enjoying, and you're on the outside. No enjoyment for you. And you're like, ah. You feel so sad. And you're gnashing your teeth. It's like, you mean Stephen made it? <laughs> if Steve, Stephen made it, why, why couldn't I make it? I could have done it. It can't be that hard. Right. <laughs> There's a lot more detail in these things. But I want you to get the concept that there will be a judgment but the judgment isn't just punishment. Actually, it's mostly reward. Do you want a reward? Yes. I mean, is your Christian life just living in fear of God? I mean, we need to fear God. Don't, don't get me wrong. But if it's just like, oh, I don't want to get punished. 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 You know, if that's your relationship with God, it's wrong. He's going to be our husband. That, that should be something really pleasant, right? We can love him. Rebecca, you're married, right? Are you just living in fear of Leon? <laughs> Isn't it sweet to be with him? Yeah. You can see she's so effusive about it. But um, We can enjoy the Lord. So what I, what I said on Sunday morning, if you were there, um, there's a difference between having to do something, like I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this, 
versus I get to do this. Oh, I have to read my Bible. Oh. Dave said that that's one of the Lord's possessions. Oh, I don't want to get punished. I better read my Bible. Versus, whoa, I can spend time in the Word. And I can contact the Lord. And I can enjoy the Lord. And I can enjoy the light in the Word. I have to go take care of on hell. Oh, man, that is so hard. Versus, oh, it's so wonderful. I can be with my brother. We can enjoy the Lord together. And Alibaba. And Alibaba. <laughs> I, I need to pray. Prayer is hard. Or it's not hard. It's so I want to have a conversation with God. I love God. If we do this, then at the judgment, it's just it, it's going to be no sweat. If you have a class and you enjoy it, you enjoy studying, you enjoy learning, the test won't be anything. This is the Christian life. And this is our full salvation. This is our complete salvation. So the judgment isn't something, it's something we need to be aware of and be very aware of it. But it's not something we need to fear. We can look forward to it because this will be the time we get our reward. And our reward will probably be just more of what we've been enjoying already. This is just the foretaste. We'll get the full taste for all of eternity. So we'll stop here. Sorry. I did not do a good job. I'll have to repent for that. Um, and like I said, if, if some of this is not clear, please ask questions. And we can have more fellowship at, with it over it during the week. Next week, we're going to get into baptism. You want to talk about a complicated subject.